We're going to get going. Could you take your seats, please? Uh, I'm David Theo Goldberg. I direct the University of California Humanities Research Institute, and uh, as well as the Digital Media and Learning Research Hub located uh, at the Institute. Uh, it's my distinct pleasure to open uh, the 2013 Digital Media and Learning Conference and to welcome uh, you all here. Uh, just a quick word about the development uh, of this. We're really in our fifth annual conference, so we can say we're here to stay. Um, we started out with a very small conference, relatively speaking, at the University of California, San Diego some five or six years ago, uh, which thematically was uh, intended to be open. Uh, we then held a, a somewhat larger conference at the University of California, Irvine, at uh, Cal IT2, uh, which was focused on diversifying participation. I mean, the point was obvious at that time. Uh, in 2011, uh, we held a conference uh, at Long Beach that many of you were at uh, on designing learning futures. Uh, and last year in San Francisco, um, we uh, focused on beyond educational technology and really launched what became a national conversation around badges for lifelong uh, learning. Um, this year, of course, the um, focus of the conference is um, uh, most timely given the state of the world we're in uh, and the state of the country we're in on democratic futures. And I want to thank Craig Watkins, who will be introduced in a moment, um, for uh, being the chairperson for the overall thematic and working very closely with us uh, in putting uh, this all together. Uh, I want to thank our sponsors, which have grown in leaps and bounds, so bear with me for a moment. Uh, above all, of course, the MacArthur Foundation, which has led the development of the initiative in digital media and learning, without whom none of us would be in this room uh, today. So I want to thank Julie Stash, uh, the Vice President, especially Connie Yao, sitting here, from whom you'll hear in just a second. Um, who has led the development of the initiative and shaped our collective lives. Um, so uh, Connie has been our intellectual uh, leader in, 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 in all of this. Uh, and then the team with whom she works, uh, Anmay Chung and Jen uh, Humke um, at, at the foundation. Uh, I want to thank also the Mozilla Foundation who has worked increasingly closely with us across the entire initiative, Mark Sermon and his team, uh, many of whom are here and from uh, whom you're here, uh, at least from some of them, uh, over the next uh, two days. Uh, and then I'm just going to, in alphabetical order, thank uh, our sponsoring organizations, uh, which have proliferated uh, increasingly. So it's great to see uh, the extension of the support the Bechtel Foundation, the Chicago Community Trust, the Grable Foundation, Hivos, uh, the McCord Hivos is a, a Dutch foundation which paid for some travel, uh, uh, the McCormick Foundation, Microsoft uh, Research, uh, who uh, have uh, supported us repeatedly, uh, the Pearson Foundation, uh, the, and the Spencer Foundation. So please join me in thanking them um, uh, all for their support. Uh, for the country. Uh, I want to uh, thank all of our staff uh, at the Digital Media and Learning Research Hub uh, at UCHRI, the Institute, uh, and at Haystack, who have worked individually and collectively uh, together uh, tirelessly, uh, sleepless nights, uh, in putting this all together. Uh, above all, I'm just going to name two names, the rest will know who they are, uh, and I can thank them individually. Um, but I, I want to thank two people, and that's Mimi Ito, the research director of the Research Hub, and especially uh, Claudio Caro Sullivan, uh, without whom uh, none of us quite literally would be physically in the space. So uh, a, a profound and warm thank you uh, to all of them and to Claudio especially. 
And finally, it is a great pleasure to introduce uh, Connie Yao, the Director of Education at the MacArthur Foundation, uh, who will introduce um, uh, uh, the, the conference as well. Thank you very much. Thank you, Thank you David. Good morning. How is everybody? Do you guys know that MacArthur is located in Chicago? So you guys are in our hometown. Welcome. I've been waiting for this event all year. You're, we're your host. How many of you are repeaters and have been to DML before? And how many of you are new to DML? Whoa, that is outstanding. So the people. week sucked. <laughs> this week we have sun and I really hope that you also get a little bit of a chance to see our great city because this is a really great place and I'm really happy that you're all here. How many of you are from Chicago? Very cool. How many of you are here from the West Coast and have no idea why you're up so early? <laughs> we'll get you some coffee, thank you. Um, so I want to give a couple of, of welcomes and some thank yous before I introduce uh, the chair of the conference, Craig Watkins. So first, I, I just want to repeat a couple of things that David said, and that is to thank the DML Research Hub, David, Mimi, and of course, Claudia, who's a saint in putting, you guys have this down to a science, and the rest of the team at the DML Research Hub, this is, uh, uh, the conference has just uh, been put together fantastically, and I can't thank you enough. So thank you all for, for your effort and for putting this together. The second folks that I want to thank, and I want to repeat the list that, that David, um, put together, and that is just to reiterate the number of uh, my philanthropic colleagues who have joined in supporting the conference. And uh, there are a couple reasons why I want to um, reiterate this list, and I actually uh, had to write it down in order to remember it. So Mozilla, Microsoft, Gates, and um, Pearson are, have been supporting us in the, the conference for a while, and so I want to thank them profusely. But we have a bunch of new sponsors and supporters this year, from Spencer to Bechtel to the Chicago Community Trust, Grable, Hivos, the McCormick Foundation. Um, and I want to call out the Spencer Foundation, Community Trust, and um, the McCormick Foundation. These are Chicago-based foundations that have joined. So if folks throughout the next two and a half days, if you run into folks from those foundations, they are new to the DML community, Please welcome them, thank them, and engage them in conversation. It's uh, terrific that they have joined, and they're also welcoming you to Chicago. So it would be great for, for you all to engage them as well. But most importantly, uh, four years ago or five years ago, MacArthur was the only real uh, sponsor of this uh, conference. With this many sponsors and supporters of the conference, what that truly means is that uh, this is your conference that it is a conference of the DML community and it's your conference. Uh, it is no longer the conference of a single funder or of even a couple of funders. It is a conference of the community and it's yours to run, it's yours to decide where it goes and it's yours to decide what it becomes. So I just wanna uh, welcome, thank you, and feel really proud of the fact that uh, the field exists, that it's here, and that you have your own conference for you all to decide what you wanna do with it. And just say that uh, four years in, that's a huge accomplishment that you all have, have uh, accomplished in such a short amount of time. And I'm thrilled that it has come to this point uh, in Chicago uh, where we can welcome you back into our city. So um, I'm just thrilled about that. So congratulations. And now what I want to do is to introduce uh, your conference chair, uh, Craig Watkins. So, let me start just with the official uh, background on Craig before I say a little bit more about him more personally. So Craig Watkins um, is a professor is at the University of Texas, Austin, where he's a professor in radio, TV, and film in the College of Communication. His, interests are, his teaching and research interests focus on race, media, youth culture, and hip-hop studies. One dimension of his, of his research, critical media studies, hones in on what he calls the new urban market and how it is reshaping American popular culture, media, and everyday life. 
A second dimension of his research examines youth media behavior and lifestyle trends, as well as the underlying sociological currents that shape them. He is the author of Hip Hop Matters, Politics, Pop Culture, and the Struggle for the Soul of a Movement, and of Representing Hip Hop Culture and the Production of Black Cinema. His most recent book, The Young and the Digital, What the Migration of Social Network Sites, Games, and Anytime, Anywhere Media Means for Our Future. It analyzes the relationship between students and social media. So that's in part his official bio. What I also want to say is that Craig has been a member of the digital media and learning community from the very beginning. He was an author of the very first John D. and Catherine T. MacArthur series on digital media and learning in 2005. He was the very first keynote at the very first digital media and learning conference. Uh, and uh, he's a member of the Connected Learning Research Network, which is, uh, and we have a report outside that has put out a report on connected learning. And one of the things that I really want to say about Craig is that when it comes to thinking about civic engagement, democracy, what it means to be a true member of a community, the first person that comes to my mind is Craig Watkins. He's been just an extraordinary member of the DML community and a great friend and colleague. And I want to introduce Craig Watkins. Whoops. Good morning. Nice introduction there. Um, thank you, Connie, for the generous uh, words uh, and the introduction. And um, like Connie and David, I also want to um, just echo uh, my thanks to the DML Hub. And there will be an opportunity um, later on uh, toward the end of the conference uh, to do more individual thanks uh, for the great work um, that they did in order to help get us all here uh, today and Thursday, Friday and Saturday as well. Um, I should also um, thank really quickly, and there will be uh, additional time to do more later, about our conference committee. Uh, which worked extremely hard to um, not only help build out this conference uh, program, but to help coordinate the panels, really help to define our thematic strands that give uh, this conference its heart, its spirit, uh, and kind of its trajectory over the course of the next three days or so. So let me just briefly recognize them. Sasha Constanja Chuck, Susan Crawford, Nigel Jacob, Ellen Middow, Nicole Mira, and Nishant Shah as our conference committee for DML uh, 2013. Uh, thank you, and can we all give our appreciation. So I'll, I'll shorten my, my comments just for, for the sake of time, but let me say that, that, that among you gathered here today uh, really represents, I think, the spirit of how uh, the DML community has grown and evolved over the last four to five years or so. So we have represented in this conference public schools, we have media arts organizations, community organizations, STEM-focused institutions, as well as a number of new learning labs that are kind of springing up all around the country and indeed the world. We have community and youth-led organizations who are represented here. Uh, and importantly, we have teachers, educators, mentors, students, uh, community organizers, researchers, designers, artists, community activists, program officers, civic leaders, students, and many, many others who will be with us over the course of the next three days or so. So just an extraordinary kind of collection of talent, expertise, and committed people to building better futures, better democratic futures, in fact. So last night, I was speaking with Mimi um, out in the, um, the lobby area, and we looked and we noticed the poster for DML was, was, was out. And it was kind of like, wow, it's finally here, it's official, uh, the conference is about to begin. But let me say to you that, that the conversations and the planning for DML began, DML 2013 began more than a year ago. And part of the emphasis in the conversation was around the sort of changing world that we see ourselves uh, looking out onto. Uh, the changing ways in which youth, civic, and political engagement are taking on new contours, new patterns, new configurations, new expressions of identity, new hopes, desires, uh, and possibilities for our future. And it was really with that in mind that we began to think about uh, the, the themes for this conference and the kinds of conversations that we might help to organize and to coordinate and the kind of work that you're doing in your various sectors around the country and indeed around the world. And we were very familiar with the sort of the common widespread narrative that young people are sort of disengaged, that they're disaffected, that they're disconnected from the world and the communities around them. 
And that strikes us, right, as an incomplete narrative, an incomplete story, because so much of the work that you're doing, so much of the work that young people in this country and around the world are doing suggests that something very different is happening. Indeed, that something very different is afoot. And we see this conference as an opportunity to sort of spotlight that, to highlight that, and to tell the story in a very different and extraordinary kind of way. So last year during the 2012 uh, keynote by John Sealy Brown, he was talking about just the rapid pace of technology and the rate at which it's changing so quickly and the struggle to design social structures and, and social practices and institutions to keep up with that pace of change. And he posed this, a question that went something like this. How will our schools, our institutions, our colleges, our research organizations look like, what will they look like in five to 10 years from now? And his answer was pretty straightforward. And that is, if they look like they do today, then we're in trouble. And I think the question that he raised then is, is a question that we can ask today as well. And that is, as we begin to look out into the future, you know, what will our public, civic, and political spheres look like? But I think the answer is slightly different. In fact, I know the answer is slightly different, because when we look out into the world, we see, we see new modes of political expression. We see new ways of sort of operating and participating on the world stage, new ways in which young people and uh, older citizens around the world are beginning to mobilize and beginning to use social and media platforms as a way to articulate new visions, new views, and new hopes for their future. And that's really the world that we wanted to spotlight and highlight over the course of the next three days or so. There's a recognition, right, that as we think about the network world, that how we think about and understand young people's engagement in their communities, young people's engagement in the lives of those around them, again, is a story that remains untold. And we hope that over the course of the next three days, we get to tell that story in some bright, inspiring, and significant ways. So just think about the last 12 months and how the world has changed and some of the sort of signature events that connect them in really powerful ways with this conference. And I just sort of did, a, did kind of a flashback of things that have happened. And so you had back in, in last year, 2012, a 15-year-old Pakistan girl being shot in the head uh, primarily because she was organizing young school children and girls to fight for their rights to be educated, uh, to fight for their right to go to school every day, to avoid domestic labor. In 2012, we also had the publishing of Revolution 2.0, a memoir by a Middle East uh, Google executive who sort of chronicled the story of young and old Egyptians alike and their rise to sort of challenge regimes of authority that had restricted access to opportunity and freedom. And one of the things that I like about that story and how he tells it, he writes about um, the day that he was abducted. And actually let the record show that he was tweeting uh, while he was abducted. Um, but he talks about uh, the interrogation over the next 11 days or so when he was blindfolded and handcuffed. And the one thing that they kept asking him over and over and over again is who's behind this? You know, who's funding this? Who's doing this? And what he tells in the story is that the Egyptian authorities had no idea. They simply couldn't see or recognize that what was happening was happening from within, from the ground up, from young people and old people alike who had decided that it was time for a new future and new possibilities. And then think about just here in this country in 2012, our elections uh, this, past, uh, this past year, where we saw, uh, again, for the third straight presidential election cycle, the youth vote uh, began to, to steady rise, but more importantly, become decisive uh, and massive in terms of its impact on the election. 42% of the young vote in 2012 was made up of Latinos, African Americans, uh, and what the census reports as, as racially uh, signified others. And what some pundits are beginning to suggest, right, is that what we've seen over the last five, four to five years or so in this country is the making of a new voting kind of political majority in which young people are sort of a part of and at the vanguard of making these new movements and changes uh, possible. And then even here in Chicago, just a few weeks ago, you had a number of Chicago youth who, who launched and initiated an online petition to urge the President of the United States to come here and to address the issue of gun violence and its impact on our communities. But in the process of doing that, uh, more than 50,000 or about 50,000 or so people followed the petition, including Mia Farrow, the actress, uh, Van Jones, uh, widely recognized as a world advocate for social justice, a former advisor to President Obama. But in their petition, they also began to urge the President not only to address the issue of gun violence, but also to address the staggering rate of unemployment among black and Latino youth in this country, as well as the sort of crumbling infrastructure of public education, because they certainly feel that crisis in public schooling in a very real and personal way, and they articulated that in a very passionate and important way. 
And then finally, there's just the work that you're doing, uh, the work that brings us here uh, today, the work that you're doing in our schools, the work that you're doing in our communities, after school programs, libraries, museums, really what represents and embodies what we call connected learning. And that idea, right, that there is a shared purpose between young people and older people, a kind of cross-generational intersection and sort of collaboration to build new pathways and opportunities for young people to realize their full potential and how that gets expressed in so many different ways. And so we thank you uh, and we look forward to learning more about the great work that you're doing, the important work that you're doing in terms of helping our young people develop a sense of political efficacy, right? That sense that their voice matters, that their vision matters, that their views matter for the world and that they can in fact be agents of social change. And so those are the kinds of things that bring us here today and the kinds of things that we hope to spotlight uh, and, and, and have conversations around over the course of the next three days or so. This is actually a good way of segueing uh, to our keynote speaker, uh, Ethan Zuckerman. So Ethan comes here today wearing uh, many different hats. Um, he is the, uh, among many things, he is the director of the Center for Civic Media at MIT. Uh, Ethan was also before that a fellow, longtime fellow, uh, at the Berkman uh, Center for Internet and Society at Harvard. He's also currently a member of the Research Network Youth Participatory Politics, uh, chaired by Joseph Kahn. Um, Ethan uh, has, has a long history in terms of sort of civic engagement, political engagement, and the role that technology might play in terms of opening new opportunities for how those things get expressed. He was a co-founder of Geek Corps, also Global Views, uh, and has been recognized widely for, the, for just thought leadership and the kind of creative and important work that he's been doing. Foreign Policy Magazine listed him as one of their global top thinkers. Newsweek magazine in 2012 in their technology issue recognized him as a civic innovator. And so Ethan brings uh, to this conference and to this conversation expertise, experience, insight, and passion for all of the things that I think many of us care about. And finally, I just wanted to read uh, what I thought was a really cool quote uh, by Christopher Leiden from Open Source Radio uh, talking about some of Ethan's work. And he writes, Ethan Zuckerman is up there with Yo-Yo Ma. That's a pretty high company among my heroic models of global citizenship. His brainchild, Global Voices Online, is my model for journalism transforming itself. And if you followed Ethan over the years and in recent months, he's talked eloquently about the ways in which civic engagement is evolving and changing right before our very eyes, right? And the ways in which, uh, the manner in which young people are beginning to express their voices, the way in which they are beginning to have their imprint or make their imprint on the world is something that's remarkable, something that's extraordinary, and something that gives us hope for new democratic futures. So with that said, uh, can we please welcome Ethan Zuckerman. Thanks so much, Craig. Uh, thanks, David. Um, I, I want to especially thank Connie, and I, I actually don't want to let her off the hook quite as easily. She, she did something very clever when she took the stage here. She thanked you for creating a movement over the space of the last four years, and that's certainly true. Uh, but a lot of us know the other story, which is that Connie has worked really tirelessly uh, to bring people together uh, into a movement. And the fact that we have such an extraordinary group of people together in this room uh, is something really worth celebrating. So if we could just get a quick round of applause again for Connie, I would appreciate that. And, and I would also note that one of the ways that you measure a success of the movement is the culture of a movement. Uh, and one of my personal indicators to that, uh, and you're welcome to use this in your own life, it's the hug to handshake ratio. Uh, and I have to say I'm running at a very high level thus far this morning, which is something that has me feeling quite good about uh, wh where we are in this conference. So uh, I just want to get my slides back to where they actually start, because uh, I, I did have a narrative, I did have a point, I knew we were going to get there. Okay, so I want to talk about a complicated idea and this complicated idea is the notion that civics is somehow in crisis. And I'm going to try to complicate that and make an argument that what's actually going on is changing. But I think to get there, we actually have to start uh, with some very disturbing video. So we're going to start with that. Can you name one Democratic candidate for the 2012 presidential campaign? No. You can't do that one either. Barack Obama, because he's running again, right? Do you know the Vice President of the United States? George Bush is the vice president. I'm the bald guy. He was going to run for it, and he has Clinton, right? Bill Clinton, Clinton, the vice president, Bill, Bill Clinton. Yeah. Yes, you did. So, 
so this is a video that was made at, at Olympia High School. It was part of a regular series of videos uh, coming out of Olympia High School's um, student paper. Uh, Olympia is a very high achieving public high school uh, in, in Olympia, Washington. Uh, and the reason this is disturbing is actually not uh, necessarily because of lack of civic knowledge uh, on the part of the students. It's actually the fact that people didn't really get the joke. Uh, what was going on were that these students were doing their own version of a long-standing Jay Leno routine called jaywalking, and I'll give you a little clip of what that looks like. First Amendment. Don't cheat on your wife. Don't cheat on your wife. So, so for, for 20 odd years, Jay Leno has walked around, usually just outside his studio. He's asked questions about civic or political life uh, of people on the streets. And you ask a whole bunch of questions, and somewhere in that mix, you get some very stupid answers. And if you string those stupid answers together, you can get a very particular form of humor based on sort of the general ignorance of the public. But it's probably not a statistically significant sample. Uh, and there's also a sense in which, because Jay has been doing this for 20 years, you know that Jay doesn't want you to give a straight answer to the question of what the First Amendment is. He's looking for a little bit of humor associated with it. Predictably, people didn't get it. So this video that came out of Olympia got an enormous amount of attention. It became the hook for a piece in the Huffington Post about the crisis in civics. It got picked up by Glenn Beck, and Glenn Beck did a long riff about how not only was there a crisis in civics, but it was very clearly a conspiracy by the Obama administration <laughs> to make youth ignorant so they couldn't get together and try to figure out how to rebel against what was going on with the Obama administration. And, and this had some really interesting implications for these high school students. They found themselves pressured by their principal to take this video down because this is a really tough message that your high performing high school that won the academic decathlon the year before is now the center of civic ignorance in the United States and the students demonstrating that they had some real civic knowledge responded by calling the ACLU and getting the ACLU to represent them. <laughs> so this is a little complicated. But you don't have to be Glenn Beck to declare that there's a crisis going on in civics. You have some very smart people like Sandra Day O'Connor also pointing out that when you test Americans on civics, they often can't answer the sorts of simple questions that you would hope that they can answer. And when you look at certain measures of youth engagement in terms of voting and elections, there are indications that we're at a significantly lower level than we were 30 or 40 years ago. The trick is, a lot of these findings are really ambiguous, they're really contradictory, they're really complicated. If you look at a study of uh, state level tests in the few states that have a civics test, there's not a dramatic drop in civic knowledge. If anything, there's actually an improvement in civic knowledge at sort of low levels. There's a bit of a drop at some of the higher levels, but it's very hard to call these graphs, which are fairly flat, a crisis. And if you look at research that, that Michael Della Carpini and colleagues have done, what this suggests is that if we're at a low level of civic knowledge, we've probably been at that level for about 50 years or so. Because when we've gone after these test scores, they actually haven't changed all that much over a period of time. What has changed is in those 50 years, we may have changed our expectations. We have far more people finishing high school. We have far more people entering and finishing college than we had 50 years ago. What this means is that the average college graduate probably does not have the same level of civic knowledge as the average college graduate 50 years ago because you're dealing with a much larger pool of people. But if you take the mean population of Americans as a whole, hard to say that it's a crisis in terms of what the general level of knowledge is. Where there is absolutely a crisis is a gap in voting behavior between people at higher and lower levels of education. And there's absolutely measured that way a civic participation gap between people who just finish high school or don't finish high school and people who go on to higher education. And that's certainly something worth looking at. But when we get into college, we're now seeing people playing with other metrics of civic engagement. How often did you have a conversation about politics? How often did civic matters come up in your dorm life? And by many of those indicators, 2008, with the first Obama election, was as good as we have seen doing year-on-year -year studies of incoming freshmen. One of the interesting questions in all of this is when we talk about civics, 
it's not entirely clear what we're talking about. Most of these studies are looking at tests that ask you questions like, what are the three branches of government? Uh, what's the role of the vice president? Or they're looking at very simple measurable behaviors like, are you registered to vote and did you vote? But civics is starting to get really complicated. And you start looking at some of the groups that are of interest to people within this room. A group like the Harry Potter Alliance, I think we're gonna hear from Andrew Slack later in the conference, who's working on people's fandom for the Harry Potter books to try to get them involved in a wide variety of social causes, including ensuring that fair trade chocolate is being used in the candies made to promote the Harry Potter movies. Or dream activists who are going after a very political topic, but are not necessarily doing it in the straightforward, let's vote for this person or that person way, are using a narrative of coming out and a narrative of self-identity to identify as undocumented and unafraid, which ends up being a deeply political statement, but often very hard to measure by some of these metrics that we're using. And this is a challenge that we've been wrestling with uh, at the group that's working on youth and participatory politics, the MacArthur Network. We have uh, a report that's come out from Joe Kahn, uh, Kathy Cohen, that tries to look at a very broad survey oversampling to make sure that we're getting very good responses from youth of color. And what we're finding in this survey is that when you ask questions about sort of non-traditional civic engagement, did you share a video, did you remix, did you have a blog comment about politics or civic engagement, you end up with levels of engagement that are roughly as high as these traditional metrics, but also look like they're growing over time, suggesting that we're gonna have to start finding a way to measure this. I don't want to make the case that there's not a crisis in civics. Or more to the point, I think we can make the case that there is a crisis in civics, but it's a crisis in agency. When you see people talking about a crisis in civics, I don't think we want to be thinking about, can you pass this test? You want to be asking the question, do people feel like they have the ability to influence their government or influence their community on the issues that they care about? And I think there is a sense in which that may be in crisis. And I think the crisis comes from the fact that the shape of civics is changing. Now, I grew up on Schoolhouse Rock, quite literally. I looked up the dates behind this. Schoolhouse Rock takes to the air the year that I'm born, runs pretty much through my childhood for 12 years. I think I've seen I'm just a bill, I'm only a bill enough that I can probably do the lyrics without actually having looked them up online. But I want to suggest that this video, which by the way, it's really fun to go back and watch it because it makes it clear just how labyrinthine the process of getting a bill through Congress ends up being. Um, but I'm not convinced that this is actually the model that we want to say to young people, here's how you learn to be a civic actor. And the reason for this is that it's particularly hard to get a bill through Congress at the moment. Not only are you at a level of, of Congress that has a level of approval below cockroaches and colostomies, <laughs> you've also gotten to the point where out of almost 4,000 pieces of legislation proposed in the last Congress, you only passed 61 of them. And so if the answer is, as a young person, the way you have influence in civics is you figure out how to call up your representative, you say, I have an idea, it ought to be a law, and you go through the complicated path of getting there, you are likely to be a very frustrated individual. And it's possible that a lot of the folks who are incredibly knowledgeable about how American government works from the inside, folks like Senator Bob Graham, who's written a book that in, in some ways is about as good as it gets in trying to figure out how to teach those governmental systems to young people, make them accessible and essentially say, look, if you want to assert power in this space, here's how you will need to do it. I think while a book like this is, is excellent and laudable, I think it may be missing sort of a fundamental disconnect as far as how we think about how civic engagement is working in the US right now. So I was at a great event that Google put together, which was sort of a post-mortem of the 2012 election. It had people from both campaigns talking about what had worked in electing Obama, what had not worked in electing Mitt Romney. In many ways, it was an incredibly dispiriting event because what I heard was that the future of, uh, of civics in the United States 
is the idea of being able to target political ads to each of our individual cable boxes. That in the future, we're not going to have to deal with an ad that tries to address the whole country or even one political party or even one state. We'll be able to target specifically the data boy. We'll be able to go after the furry hatted vote. Uh, and we'll be able to sort of micro-target down to the individual household, which was really, really exciting the people who do broadcast campaigns and really making scared a lot of the people who are sort of thinking about how the internet might lead to higher levels of participation. And, and Oscar Salazar from CityVox um, made a wonderful observation uh, that, that I've been thinking about and sort of riffing on from there, where he said, look, I, I feel like we're dealing with an 18th or 19th century model of politics in a 21st century electorate. And, and I took the train back from that conference and I've been thinking about it ever since, and, and I want to break it out slightly further. I think what we're dealing with is a government that in DC and in many state houses is very much based on a 19th century model, but that the participants get elected on a 20th century broadcast model, and the citizens want to find a way to interact in a 21st century participatory media model. And, and, and here's, here's what I mean by this. When we started the American experiment, there was a wonderful debate at the foundation about how many people a representative, a, a member of Congress, should represent. And the argument was between one representative to 30,000 people and one representative to 40,000 people. And one of the very few things George Washington said in debates about shaping the Constitution was that he thought one to 40,000 was too high. We had to get down to one to 30,000. Now, a lot of this had to do with being a much smaller nation, but a lot of this had to do with the notion that we have a politics based on the assumption of face-to-face -face contact based on the assumption that if you really needed to, you could get in to see your representative. You might actually know that person as a member of the business community. That might not be a professional politician, but is probably a tradesman who's known within your community. And that by having that personal relationship, you could then put your trust in that person to advocate for your interests. We've expanded the House of Representatives, but not nearly as fast as we've expanded the population of the nation. And we're now nearing one representative for 700,000 citizens, which radically changes the sort of relationship that you can have. Unless you are a very special sort of person, which is to say famous, powerful, or wealthy, you probably do not have that face-to-face -face relationship with your representative. What you have is a heavily mediated relationship, where where you're dealing with your representative is through television. You're dealing with a broadcast medium where you have a politician who's able to say, look, I want to speak to your interests, but I have to speak to all of your interests at the same time. And by the way, since the rise of cable television news, I have to speak not just to you in my district, I have to speak to the whole nation. Because the chances of my getting elected have a lot to do with whether I'm going to be in line with my party on the national level. And if I'm stepping too far out of line, I'm going to get smacked down. So that notion of having that sort of one-on-one -on -one relationship of understanding who you are, understanding your interests, is now blurred out to a broadcast model where you have very little feedback. You have the possibility of writing a letter, you have the possibility of protest, but you probably don't have that face-to-face -face possibility. And as we start moving into these broadcast models, we're starting to see what it does to politics. It's profoundly homogenizing. If you look at what Congress looked like in 1982, just as cable news really starts to get traction, you've got 60 moderates, people who you could reliably identify and say, we don't know if these folks are going to vote Democrat or Republican because they vote in all sorts of different places. We get to the point in 2010 where you can't call anyone a moderate anymore. There's no significant divergence in voting patterns. And you've headed to a model where we're basically electing these local representatives on a national level using broadcast media of one fashion or another. This all feels very strange to people who've grown up with participatory media. We're really used to the idea that we create content, we put it out in the world, someone responds to it. Maybe it's just our circle of closest friends. Maybe it's an extended circle of people. Maybe things go viral. Maybe they spread. But one way or another, we're used to this notion that we can have a voice, we can put it out there, and we might get some response to it. 
And you can see the early efforts that people are making to try to figure out how do we do civics at a time where we can put out our voice and we can try to figure out how to have influence in scale. And we can also watch institutions try to figure out how we deal with this. You've got the White House doing something that's both very laudable and also a little strange with we the people. This is a 21st century update of an 18th century technology. The heyday for the petition was the abolition of slavery. I mean, this is a very strange box to try to put our participation into, but it has a lot to do with this notion that we just don't know how to scale and how to listen to people who are trying to figure out how to articulate their voices. And so the first thing we've said is, we actually need to get to the point where there are 100,000 of you, at that point we're gonna feel the obligation to respond. Which, by the way, is a hell of a lot better than we don't have an obligation to respond, but is not the sort of responsiveness that we would really hope from at a moment where we're encouraging everybody to be creating and sharing media of one fashion or another. I've been arguing for a while now, and this is always a good slide to start arguments, that four movements that apparently have nothing in common have something in common, which is that they are post-state, heavily mediated movements. I'm gonna make the argument that what the Tea Party, Occupy, uh, Anonymous, and WikiLeaks have in common is that they're not particularly concerned with passing legislation in Congress. In fact, the Tea Party, for the most part, would like to freeze Congress to the point where you're not passing any legislation. For many of the rest of these organizations, they're essentially saying, we don't think that's where the action is. From Occupy's essential refusal to sort of say, we're not gonna put forward a legislative agenda, we think the whole system is broken, to WikiLeaks, in many ways, essentially saying, we think the whole system is broken, we think that secrets are the way to take it down, to Anonymous essentially saying, eh, you know, the politics stuff, possibly interesting. Media is where it's at. If we can figure out how to manipulate that space, we can figure out how to have influence. These guys aren't figuring out how to grab those levels of legislative change. They're looking at a very different form of change. And I think we have to start taking those efforts that change extremely seriously and asking some hard questions about them. So here are some of the hard questions that I want to ask. We have a lot of conversations at MIT within the Center for Civic Media where we try to figure out how to read a particular protest or a particular tactic. And one of the ways that we've started taking this on is, is using this matrix. And these are very rough categories. These are you know, not binary categories, but I'm, I'm gonna try to play with them because I found them very helpful in sort of thinking about this space. We put up one axis of thick and thin. And what I mean by that is there are types of civic engagement that basically ask you to show up, but they tell you what to do. You know, when you are told, we need you to sign this petition, we need you to donate $10 to the Red Cross, that is, generally speaking, a fairly thin form of engagement. They're not inviting you to suggest your own response to earthquakes in Haiti. They'd like you to pitch in because they know, or they believe, that at scale, they'll have a way to have impact. A thick form of civic engagement essentially says, we want your creativity. We want your strategic mind. We want you as a media maker. We want you to think about how you help us solve this problem. And thick activism is very, very challenging. It's a much more difficult space to work in, but I'm also finding that it's a space that many people want to work in. And they get very frustrated when the ask is a thin ask of one fashion or another. The second axis, this is one that I get in trouble from, uh, but I'm gonna get in trouble for a lot of things around this talk, so we'll just go for it, um, is, is basically going from symbolic to impactful. And what I mean from that is that there are ways to take action where it's primarily about voice. It's primarily about making a statement. It's primarily about articulating your position and your identity on an issue. And there's also ways to go after impact, which is to say, I see a way to make change in the world, and I see a pathway towards that change. And so we've started to try to think about different forms of activism within this two by two matrix. So let's start with one of the most popular, and frankly, one of the better critiques of online activism. Uh, Evgeny Morozov has a new book coming out. One of the themes that connects it to his last book is this idea of either clicktivism or slacktivism. And Evgeny's argument is that 
if we're active online, it's a very thin way of participating. If we decide we like a movement and we give it a Facebook like and we do nothing beyond that, it's also probably purely symbolic. It's, it's a badge of identity, but it's not something that actually uh, is attached to any sort of lever that has changed in the world. And I think it's perfectly legitimate to criticize certain parts of civic engagement and certain parts of activism as being slacktivism or collectivism. It's a way of saying that that's both thin and symbolic. If you manage to get it to a large enough scale, it might have very powerful impact in saying a million people clicked on this, a million people tried to call attention to this, but the danger is that this can be a very lightweight form of engagement in one fashion or another. Now, being thin is, is not necessarily a bad thing. Lord knows I'd love to be a little thinner. Um, but when you think about something like voting, voting is necessarily a thin form of engagement. When voting gets thick, that's when we bring it into the Supreme Court and essentially saying you're putting up unconstitutional barriers to vote. We need voting to be thin because we need it to be incredibly accessible because we really want millions and millions of people to do it. And the hope, though there's good critiques out there, I recommend Quinn Norton's you know, decision not to vote in the 2012 elections and her essay on that to sort of think about whether voting is impactful if you think a system is broken. The theory behind voting is that it's thin, it requires little participation from us other than showing up at the polls and making our, we hope, informed decisions, but that it has enormous impact. And you could certainly make the case that the momentum for immigration reform in the US at the moment demonstrates that simply showing up to vote and having a lot of Latinos show up to vote can have enormous impact through a fairly thin act of showing up and saying, hey, we've got political power. You need to start thinking about where we go. Another controversial statement. When people talk about Occupy and when they critique it, a lot of that critique is based around the notion that Occupy was thick but largely symbolic, which is to say very few people want to deny the fact that people put an enormous amount of time and energy, personal risk into showing up uh, at encampments uh, to try to build governance systems, but you can make the argument that in many cases the impact was more calling attention to the notion of inequality rather than trying to move a specific lever of change to try to pass legislation, to try to oust powerful institutions. Again, you know, open to the critique that this is an oversimplification of it. In many ways, I would actually point to something like Occupy Sandy as a great example of where something gets thick and extremely impactful where you had very experienced occupiers in Brooklyn saying, look, we see a way in which we can take what we've learned from occupation and we can put it towards a problem that right now the federal government is not doing a particularly good job of solving. We can solicit goods and we can figure out how to bring them out to people who really need them. Now what's interesting is that when you start playing in this space of efforts that are impactful and thick, they clearly have an influence on the people that they're trying to help. They clearly are leading to some sort of change. They're inviting your creativity. They're inviting your strategic mind. They're inviting your full participation. We often discover that they're working at very small scales. And this is really challenging because this is the part of the graph that we'd like to be in. We'd like to be impactful. We'd like to be thick. We'd like to recognize people's creativity. We'd like to make sure that what they're doing has a change in the world. And we'd also like to help them figure out, can we do it not just in one neighborhood? Can we do it at the sort of scale to transform the problems that the nation as a whole is having? So this is how I'm starting to look at this. I'm interested in that bottom right-hand corner. I want, in my activism, in the social change work that I'm doing, I want to be impactful, thick, and at scale. And I want to try to help people figure out how to get there. And a lot of what I'm trying to work through at the moment is figuring out how do we move into that very difficult quadrant. So here's a first thought on this. We've been doing a bunch of work uh, through youth and participatory politics working with digital activists 
um, all over the world, really looking at a global perspective on digital activists. A couple of my students and I went to Istanbul a couple of weeks ago. We sat down with a dozen activists from 10 different countries to talk about what was going on in their campaigning. And the first thing that we found out, well, let me just tell you a little bit about them first. The project on the far left is called Kirti.org. This is a project being run right now out of Bangalore, and it's a project trying to deal with corruption in the cab market. Uh, so auto rickshaws are the way that you get around much of India. They're certainly the way that you get around Bangalore. Depending on whether you speak with a Bangalore accent, there is a decent chance that what you pay for your ride in the motorized rickshaw might be significantly more than you should be paying. And if you're making very little money and, and the motor rickshaw is how you get to work, this is a really big deal and it's a systematic corruption problem. And so the idea behind Kirti is to try to encourage people to report via an SMS short code, I got ripped off, the meter was running improperly, the driver didn't know where he was going, he broke down, he wouldn't give me my money back and turning this into a map which is working very, very closely with the government of the city of Bangalore to try to figure out whether they should be pulling licenses from people. In the middle is, is probably my single favorite activist campaign for the last couple of months, and it's mostly because where it's coming from. Um, so this is a consumer advocacy campaign in Myanmar. And I found that absolutely crazy because two years ago, if you told me that you would see any online activism in Myanmar, I would tell you it's never going to happen. And now what we're seeing is a Facebook campaign focused on the 5,000 kyat mobile phone. So here's how to understand this. 5,000 kyat's about six US dollars. And the campaign is what people believe a SIM card should cost. Two years ago, you could buy a mobile phone handset, but to get it on the Myanmar mobile phone network, you had to buy a SIM card that cost $2,000. And this is for a low-income nation. So this was basically a way of saying, no, you cannot have a mobile phone. And it recently came down significantly. It's down to $250. But what people are now saying is, look, we've gone online. We've looked at prices in Laos. We've looked at prices in Cambodia. It's about $6 in those countries. We want the 5,000 kyat mobile phone. And what's crazy about this is for a country that was largely cut off from the internet, this is largely a Facebook meme-based campaign trying to get down to a $6 SIM card. I saw my first Burmese lol cat the other day. It won my heart from the very inside. But this is really amazing to sort of watch consumer activism sort of come, come, come to scale. The last one's called rinda.org. This is a project that comes out of work that was done recovering from the forest fires that ended up devastating a lot of central and western Russia. And you had a lot of volunteers in Moscow coming out and saying, can we help people in these small towns that are being devastated by these forest fires? And they ended up picking up the symbol of the rinda. The rinda is the village bell that you ring to get people to come put out a fire. And the argument that was made in 2010 when these fires were raging was, geez, you know, we really don't need the centralization of communism. We don't need the hotline to Moscow because Moscow doesn't do anything for us. If we just had our windows back, maybe we could find a way to help each other. And so this is a project that if you're having an emergency in Moscow, you can send a text message to this network and someone will pick you up because your car broke down. Or someone will give you a place to wait for a couple of hours for a locksmith because you've locked yourself out of your apartment. It's peer-based support. So we're looking at these forms of activism, and, and, and so we put this conference together, and I told my students that I would expect that I would mostly find people saying, I'm pissed off about this, and therefore I started a Facebook group. And pretty much the only one we saw is this Myanmar one, which I, I gotta say, you know, given that there was no Facebook and that there was no political activism online, I, I'm okay with that as a form of activism. Um, but what we found were people using these very creative approaches. And what we also found was this really interesting sharp line. We asked people and we said, well, this is so exciting. You're getting involved with politics. And they would say, no, 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 no. We have nothing to do with politics. They drew this incredibly sharp line between being political and being active. And all the three people behind this would wave their hands angrily as soon as we brought politics into it. They saw this as a form of activism, a form of engagement, a form of social change, but absolutely not political. And so talking about this, 
we've been talking about the idea that we need to think about different levers that people are trying to manipulate. So levers is sort of my metaphor for when you think you're having civic impact, who or what do you think you're moving? And what people were basically telling us was that they didn't want to be seen as pulling on the lever that was about electing someone or passing legislation. They wanted to pull on other levers. So, so here are some four possible levers. These aren't the only levers, but these are four that we end up talking about. So in thinking about uh, gay rights in the, in the US, in thinking about marriage equality, in many ways sort of the gold standard of change that we would hope for would be pulling this sort of legislative lever. We'd really like to get marriage equality, we'd really like to get equality as a whole enshrined in constitutional amendment because then we would have the whole force of law behind us. We would have an executive branch responsible for enforcing those laws. We would have the legislative branch, you know, trying to write laws that were consistent with it. We would have the judicial branch trying to make sure that there's no judicial conflict. You get the entire force of the state behind you. But this can be a very slow and very contested space for change, as anyone who's been fighting for marriage equality is finding. So we also look at other things. We try to figure out, can we influence a single authority figure? And an authority figure might be an elected official. In many cases, that authority figure is an unelected official. We see authority forms of change come into place a whole lot in the developing world. When we look at the Arab Spring, that's essentially an authority-based revolution, where it sort of says, until we oust Ben Ali and Mubarak, we can't do anything else. But in some cases, we don't want to oust, we just want to get people to change their minds. And so getting President Obama to essentially say, look, I wasn't for it before, now in my next term I'm very strongly for marriage equality, that may be a path forward to trying to get change wherever that authority figure has the ability to make change. But we're also seeing other theories of change getting invoked. There are lots of theories of change that basically say, look, if you really want equality, for gays, lesbians, transgendered, bisexual, queer, you have to change culture as a whole. You have to go after public opinion because it's not enough to enshrine those rights. What you're really trying to do is change the hearts and minds of those people around you. And this is an incredibly long form of change. We've seen it happen in some cases. The fact that most of us don't think about whether there's a smoking or non-smoking floor in this hotel. Uh, the fact that people who go out and party tonight are generally speaking not going to be driving back to their homes because we've had a real cultural shift around drinking and driving. Those were 20, 30, 40 year cultural change campaigns that get carried out. It's an incredibly powerful way to get change, but it's a very slow and gradual way to get change. And when we're finding ourselves working on slow change, in many cases, what we actually want to figure out is how do we build the infrastructures to solve our problems in the short term before we get the public will, before we get the legislative will, before we get the powerful authority that can help them out, can we build something that will protect gay and lesbian youth from suicide in the meantime? And can we staff it either on a local level or a national level by building our own infrastructure before we get that large form of change? So what's useful about this, I think, is that when you start looking at these levers, you can pull things apart into tactics and what those tactics are trying to influence. When you're petitioning people, generally speaking, you're trying to influence a legislative body, you're trying to influence an authority. You might a little bit be trying to influence public opinion, but it's really hard to petition people to be nice to gays and lesbians. In many cases, you're petitioning because you see a very specific change that you want to see enacted in one fashion or another. But this is also pretty helpful, and we'll talk about this in one of the plenaries today, in taking on very difficult tactics. So something like denial of service attacks used like a group by Anonymous. You can decide whether you think this is a good idea or not, but you can use this theory to look at this and figure out that this might be a coherent idea. That folks with Anonymous, when they're protesting Bank of America's treatment of WikiLeaks, are saying, look, we want to influence an authority, and we also want to try to figure out how to influence public opinion over time. One of the things that happens in this space is that we pay an enormous amount of attention to this part of the matrix. We're very, very interested in authority-based theories of change that have physical presence in the real world. 
you look at millions of Americans tuning into Tahrir Square, and in many ways, that is our classic example of how we think change happens in the world. And the fact that there's such an echoing conversation about the significance of the Arab Spring, which has proved to be far, far more complicated than it looked when uh, essentially the first steps were taken. It's really interesting to see a heavy focus in this space. When I talk to people in online spaces, here's where they tend to focus. They want to use tactics that use media. They want to go after public opinion. And the reason that they want to do this is that, first of all, this is what they know how to do. They know how to create spreadable and shareable online media. And they even, in some cases, know how to A-B test it and try to figure out what's more effective than others. They love the fact that you can put this out there and you can track it and you can try to figure out what's going on. What's really challenging in all of this is it's very, very difficult to know what sort of impact you're having on at least two different levels. If you're going after a public opinion theory of change, you might be looking for change over 20, 30, or 40 years. And we're also still learning how different forms of media are interacting with one another. What does it do when you sign up for Coney 2012? What does it do when you tweet about it? Does that influence a larger media dialogue? Does it influence a political dialogue? These are really hard measurement questions that we have to ask if we want to get anywhere on this. So we're not just trying to work on that symbolic impact axis. We're also very interested in this thin, thick axis. And when I think about these questions of thick engagement, remember what I'm talking about with thick engagement is engagement that doesn't just say, please show up and do what I tell you, but says, please come join me and help me figure out where we're going in this movement. One of the first things I look to for inspiration in this is the notion of interest-driven learning. Uh, and so I'm very much influenced by Mimi Ito's work in this. When I look at spaces like Umedia in Chicago, a library space built around exploring your own interests, it strikes me that this is one of the sort of the first clues we have on how we want to teach civics. We have to look at what people's interests and passions are. We have to figure out how to help them learn more and deepen their knowledge on it so they can do more than just show up and engage in that very thin fashion. And so I look to folks like Andrew Slack and Harry Potter Alliance and sort of say, this might be where we learn some of our lessons from this. This is a group that basically says, look, what do we have in common? We've got a fandom. We care deeply about the Harry Potter books. We care deeply about the values behind them. We're used to creating media. We're used to making fan creations. We're used to talking online. We're used to publishing. Can we use those same ideas and those same tactics to educate ourselves and educate others about an issue and then become very creative actors in trying to figure out how we change the world around it? There are so many critiques of Coney 2012. We could easily do a whole other keynote just hanging out on this slide, glossing over it very quickly, quickly footnoting all the things that I'm disturbed about with Coney 2012. Let me say, quite successful campaign in the sense that they put up a very well thought out, thin ladder of engagement for the people who are involved. They essentially said, look, we're going to cast an incredibly broad net. We're going to get a video out to 100 million people. Some fraction of those people are going to take the next step of spreading it. Some are going to take the next step of putting up posters. Some might take the next step of becoming team leaders in their community. Some of them finally, at the top of that ladder, might become part of our core organizing team on all of this. One of the reasons that this fell apart is the reason that ladders of engagement often fall apart. As activists, we really want people to get up this ladder as fast as we can possibly get them up there because we need more help at the top. So we want to make it as easy as possible. We want to make it really easy for you to climb to that next rung so we make it as thin as we possibly can. But there's another way to do this. We can basically say that as we take you up that ladder of engagement, we need you to deepen your knowledge. So that when people come in and ask the question, why does Invisible Children spend the majority of its money on filmmaking? you have an answer other than, oh, I didn't know that. I thought it was mostly going into the field in Uganda. Well, IC's answer may actually be a very reasonable one, which is that they're really the promotional arm of a much broader movement. But if you don't have that deeper knowledge of who's in that broader movement, there's no way to answer that question. When the question comes in and says, where are all the Ugandans? You know, who's representing those voices on the ground? 
those critiques have a lot more sting for people who don't know the extent to which there's involvement on the ground or if there is involvement on the ground. This is a much harder path to lead people on. This basically says, look, I don't need you to just you know, agree to donate 10 bucks to my campaign, then put up a lawn sign, then join my phone back, then bring people out. This is like saying, I need you to help elect me, which means I need you to help think about what my policy positions are, what my marketing strategy is, you know, where we're gonna put the TV ads and how we go. Most of us don't do this because it's really big and really scary. But if we really wanna get that form of thick engagement and movements, this is what we want. We want people not just to commit to us, we want them to get really smart about what we're doing. We want them to sort of think through these issues in a way that's subtle and complicated and often critical. And you can imagine this working in some very different ways. You can imagine people who see the video and use that as a first step to learn about the LRO, to learn about invisible children, to ask some hard questions, possibly decide that they'd rather be working on the ground with people in central and northern Uganda who want to work on this issue, but still see themselves as part of the leadership of this movement looking for justice uh, in a long time stalled conflict. Some of this is about literacy, and it's about a very deep form of media literacy. Dan Gilmore's second book, Media Active, I tend to refer to this book not by its title, but as none dare call it media literacy. What Dan basically argues is that as we start moving into the space where people are creating media, people are arguing, people are, are battering ideas back and forth, we need to learn how to read in that space. And what I would argue is that youth desperately need to learn how to read in that space, and civically engaged youth more than anybody else need to learn to read in that space because we're doing a disservice if we just tell people do this, now do this, now do this. What we really want to tell people is it's great that you're doing this, let me help you learn more so you can decide what you want to do next so that somewhere in the process you are telling us what we should be doing next. Finally, I'm just starting to think about this question of how we bring this stuff to scale. Remember, my argument is that much of that work that's in that quadrant that's both thick and impactful tends to happen at a hyper-local level. It tends to be something like Occupy Sandy, where you have a great community able to step up to a problem you know, right in their immediate vicinity. But the critique becomes, that's one community, what do you do everywhere else? Maybe you need something as big, as complex, in many ways as thin as the Red Cross, which knows what to ask you, knows how to ask you, and where to go. And what was interesting was when I was putting this slide together, it was not hard to find an Occupy Sandy logo. It's actually surprisingly challenging to find an American Red Cross logo. And what happens when you look for an American Red Cross logo is you get to American Red Cross's brand page. And after explaining to you where you can and cannot use the logo, what is and is not appropriate, you then get an application to download the American Red Cross's digital logo, and you have to talk about how you're affiliated with the organization, how you plan to use it, et cetera, et cetera. I ended up not filling out the application. I just cut and paste one from someone's web page. It's the digital world, that's how we roll. But it is really interesting to think about how an organization like the American Red Cross tries to deal with working at incredible scale, but also working around this idea of thick engagement. Here's a contrast, right? Planned Parenthood in danger of losing an enormous amount of funding uh, through Susan G. Komen comes out and essentially says to some of their strongest supporters, look, we don't know what to do, but we really do believe that if we have public opinion on our side, we're gonna be in a much stronger case on this. So can you help us think out what to do? Deanna Zant puts together a campaign called Planned Parenthood Saves Me. And it's very, very simple, it's a Tumblr you can post your story of how Planned Parenthood saved you. And maybe it was saving you from a pregnancy that you weren't ready for. Maybe it was saving you in terms of basic women's health. Maybe it was saving you in terms of a person that you really needed to talk to in a moment of need. And they got thousands of stories. And that's just a sample of some of them that came up. Planned Parenthood has now given an award to Deanna and to this campaign for how they managed to use this sort of thick, participatory, creative, and at scale form of activism to call a great deal of attention to a situation and ultimately get the outcome that the organization that was looking for. 
So look, in this work, we're really early. And one of the reasons I wanted to talk to this group is that I think this is the sort of group that's gonna help us figure out is this the right way to think about it? What are we missing? What aren't we considering within this? Is this helpful? How does this help us think about how we teach civics and how we help activists with civics? But a lot of the work that we're doing right now is descriptive. We're going out, we're trying to understand really inspiring movements like the Dream Activists, like Rinda.org. But then we're trying to do some more complicated work. We're trying to do evaluative work. This is work that Yohai Benkler uh, at Harvard, our team over at MIT have been doing, trying to figure out what happened with the campaign against Sopa Pipa. And so we've taken the tens of thousands of news stories and blog posts around Sopa Pipa that had an incredible effect. Once Wikipedia blacked out, you saw the vast majority of Congress people who were supporting that bill switch sides overnight. And suddenly that bill in all practical forms was dead within Congress and within the Senate. And so we're going through 18 months of what that online conversation looked like to try to understand who was influential and when, how you're asserting power in these spaces, and how we decide in cases where there's a less clear victory like that, did we do it, did we have the success that we wanted, did we figure out how to move the lever? What I'm hoping we're gonna get over time is to a normative state where we can sort of say to you, I think this is how we want to think about civics. I think this is how we want to teach civics. I think we want to support sites like Policy Mike that try to talk to young people and help them figure out how to be online political commentators, but also figure out how to be in constructive engagement with people who are coming from a different political point of view. We want to get to the point where we can try to give some advice on how you would actually do this. And this is the moment where if I were a good scholar, I would tell you, I need five to 10 years extensive funding from MacArthur and I'll be able to come back to you. Instead, being an activist who's dragged into scholarship, I'm gonna tell you what I think, even though I don't have a good way to justify it. I think that if we want civic participation that's thick, that's impactful and scalable, I think we need to get rid of thinking of this divide between politics and activism. I think what happens right now is that some small group of people get recruited into this specialized uh, profession that is politics. You get identified in high school, you get identified in college, someone takes you behind the curtain and shows you how it really works. Uh, if you want a picture of this, look at a book like The Victory Machine and look at these sort of micro-targeting tactics that have sort of come up in winning presidential and congressional elections in the US, there's a sense in which this is its own specialized dark art. We cannot afford to let politics be separated from other forms of social change. We have to think about this whole spectrum of levers that we're trying to manipulate, and we have to think about how do you help somebody increase their agency. At the end of the day, it has to do with how do I help an individual or a group of people try to make the change that they want to see in the world? We need to think about not just the tactics that we use. When we study activism, we focus a lot on tactics. We look at, you know, do online petitions work? Do sit-ins work? You know, do viral videos work? And the answer on all of these is they might work. They might work if they're attached to an actual theory of change. They might work if they're attached to someone you want to persuade at a particular moment of time. So when we teach people about civics, when we teach them about agency, we have to teach them about what are these diverse levers. Not just how do you pass legislation, but how do you try to persuade a group of people. Not just how do you petition an authority with a boycott or a boycott, but how do you build your own infrastructures for change. We need to think about how we get people not just to climb this ladder of engagement, but to take on this much more difficult task of deepening the knowledge that this all rests on. And we need to take that moment where students are coming to us and saying, I really want to find out about this, I'm really excited about this, and see that as the teachable moment. And see that as the moment where we basically say, well, I don't know much about the LRA as well, but let me show you how we would try to find that out. How would we work together? How would we learn that together? We have to understand, particularly those of us who are involved with building movements, those of us who are trying to work on social change at scale, that getting thick, impactful participation at scale almost certainly involves devolving control. 
We've got to find some way to have trust, have faith in these people who we want to be our new leaders and help them share in the movements that we're trying to build. Thank you all for the chance for this. Thanks for listening. Really looking forward to talking with people about it. Very grateful to be here. Really excited about what we're doing together. Thank you so much. Up, man. This is awesome. <laughs> okay, so we do have time for Q&A, and Claudia, I'll let you come up and signal to us when we need to get in transition to, uh, to our panels. But for now, if you have questions for Ethan, uh, we can go ahead and take some of those. Do we have a mic? Where would I look? Cool. Do we have anyone at a mic? Yeah. Awesome. I can't see it all. That, that, whoever that is is right behind the lights. You may have to like, trigger people to ask questions, because I, I just can't see who's there. I'm Charlie Quentin. Uh, what is the uh, impact of uh, broad, opening up broad spectrum radio going to do in the Freedom to Connect movement? Um, are you talking about spectrum from uh, audio broadcast or are you talking about from mesh networks and other ways to, to get access to connectivity? Yes. Yes. Okay. <laughs> so um, on the one hand, I'm incredibly enthusiastic about the ways that increasing people's ability to create content has brought more people into this sort of participatory model of engagement. And almost everything that I'm talking about is sort of based around this idea that more and more people are routinely creating, even if what they're creating is a Facebook status update or a tweet or something that they're sharing with just a couple of people, they're getting into the model where they're creating as well as consuming. I think that's incredibly important. So whenever new spaces are opening up, I think we're getting to the point where there's more opportunities to create. All that said, I don't know that as soon as we open up a new space, people magically flock there. And so one of the things that I've been making the case for over the years for activists using technology is I've been trying to push activists to work in spaces where a lot of people are already using the tools, where they already have audiences. All that said, there's the problems of digital divides. And to the extent that we are extending networks into places that they've never gone before, that to me is a very radical and impactful activity over time as those people come into play. But it's also a real challenge for us. One of the problems that we've had in our work at Global Voices is that while we've gotten very good at figuring out who those people in rural Cambodia who've managed to get access to create media, whether it's audio media or online media, is trying to find audiences for them. And I think for me, that's one of the biggest challenges. You can't just assume that because more people are coming onto networks that we're going to hear their voices, we have to think about how we amplify them. Over here. Hi. Um, am I audible? OK. So um, I, my situation is a little peculiar because I come from India, and I'm, I've been working with Wikipedia promotion in Indian languages. So it's a kind of knowledge activism. And I, I agree with most of what you say, but where I find it really hard to go on with your narrative is like how smoothly it goes. Because um, at times when we envision this entire knowledge activism project, and when it's in the United States or somewhere in more media literate and knowledge uh, societies, it's so easy to actually implement what you think. And, and it mostly works out like that because there's something like good faith. But especially in the case of India, what has been happening is not only the access problem, but also the lacking desire for change itself. So the kind of change that you and I talk about, like how Wikipedia could revolutionize or is already revolutionizing the world, is somehow not being translated in desire. Like that's not what people want to hear or that's not sounding exciting to them. Do you want to say something about that? Well, let me say a couple of things. Um, when Craig introduced me, he, he's mentioned that I've sort of had a couple of different careers. And, and for me, in some ways, th this has been a, a new career. I almost never 
talk about activism in the US, but I've sort of been forced into that over the last two years because I took a job focused on civic media in the US. So in many ways, the last 20 years of my work have been on questions like the one that you're wrestling with of access to knowledge and empowerment of people in developing world communities. So this is clearly an oversimplified model. It doesn't help with all of the questions that you're putting forward. And you're absolutely right that one of the questions in all of this is, do people have that space, that energy, that time, that room in their life for civic engagement in one fashion or another? I've also been involved with trying to get people in Sub-Saharan Africa to contribute to smaller language Wikipedias. Uh, and one of the issues is that the people that we most need to contribute are people who often have a lot of other things going on in their lives that make it very, very hard to have that time to create free knowledge. And I think one of the things we have to be very sensitive to is that when we try to work on global scales, models that work very, very well in the North don't always work in the South. The assumption that people have an enormous amount of cognitive surplus and excess time, in sort of Clay Shirky's terms on this, doesn't necessarily translate to other environments. And so the answer may be not necessarily building movements around open knowledge, but possibly building them around cultural preservation, but a, maybe even more likely building them around education, building them around job opportunity. Is there a way in which being part of a movement like this is somehow bettering your life, is getting you to the point where you're more likely to have personal, familial, economic success? One thing that's worked very well for us at Global Voices is the extent to which our 900 translators, many of them working in very small languages, um, like Malagasy, uh, are finding that that work is helping them try to make a living as a translator, and so become sort of a step towards that. So i very sensitive to the fact that these models don't always work universally, very sensitive to these facts that these models are, are great generalizations, but hope that you'll keep putting these challenges in front of people, uh, because I think if we're gonna try to take these ideas and hope that they're gonna work in other parts of the world, we have to get very smart about what local conditions and local motivations are. Is that it? Okay. I think Craig's telling me that's it. I can't see anything, so I'm totally blind up we here. We do have another but, question, but we, we have to. Okay. So uh, grab me. I'm around all day today. I think I'm around tomorrow. Would love to keep talking to everybody on this. Uh, hit me up online. Hit me up on Twitter. Would love to continue the conversation. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Okay, thanks again, Ethan. And um, so thank you for uh, participating in our keynote. So we will now transition into the next uh, phase of the program. And I think this room is about to be turned over so that it can become functional uh, for the next series of events. So uh, thank you, and uh, we're looking forward to the rest of the day and the week. Thank you. <laughs>